Hallo, my name is Max. I'm the CEO at Rebatech. We are a Norwegian company and we also have a stand uh, in Hall C3. I'm going to talk about uh, reinforcement, rebar, today and how we um, approach it. Before I do that, I want to share some inspiration with you, um, things that inspire us, inspire me, and the way we work. This guy, does anybody know this guy? Okay, before I ask you, whom of you has two hands? Okay, okay, a few. Okay, good. And I can't expect too many like lifting their arms and, and knowing this guy. This guy is a construction engineer. Uh, a German construction engineer that studied in uh, Berlin. His name is Konrad Zuse. And the funny thing about him is he is one of the inventors of a computer. So how did a construction engineer end up inventing a computer? Well, he was bored doing a lot of calculations and then he built this thing to do all the calculations for him. So how, how's this inspiration for us? Well, we, we, we can think out of the box and we can do crazy stuff, even though we are engineers. This is also inspiration. Um, this is like from some people in, in, in the desert and it seems to be some kind of like national sport there to change your tires while you flip your car on the side. Um, I use this analogy because what, what we are doing is um, we are building our car, in our case, like a company in our technology, while we use it, while we drive on the motorway with it. So we are in live projects, we are actually producing rebar cages, while we're still like developing our company and our technology. So it's like trying to balance that, right? I mean, we want to work towards like a Formula One stop, we're not there yet. This, um, I just showed you like our approach and that's kind of like clashing a little bit with the needs of the construction industry because it's a very risk averse industry, right? So nobody wants to build something and then see it fall to the side. So there's a very good reason for, for avoiding risk in our industry. We want to build stuff that lasts for a hundred years and is safe for people to use. So we must never sacrifice safety like, like the guys did in the, on the last slide. Um, and I'm soon done with inspiration, but this is also inspiration because it's from a different industry, but 10 years ago, it was common knowledge that a rocket is a single use thing. You, you, you throw it up and then you throw it into the ocean. Well, everybody can imagine that if, if you would do the same thing with planes, trucks, uh, tra airplanes, if we use them one time, it would be a very, very expensive train ticket. And, and, and so is, is, is for the rocket industry. So what did they do? They asked a very big question, right? Can't we make rockets that can be reusable? That would be really cool. And what they found out is that they have to really go out of the, um, out of the box because rocket industry was a little bit like construction industry is today. There's like a lot of different players. Somebody's making a design, somebody's ordering the rockets, and then there's lots of lots of different companies that make all the components for the rockets. So these guys here, they said, screw that. Um, we have to vertically integrate. We have to think the whole rocket from design to how we manufacture it, how we fly it, and how we reuse it. And the effect of that is that it's becoming a lot cheaper. So this slide is showing like the cost of transporting something to orbit and the scale of it is logarithmic. So it's like a little difficult to see, but if you look on the left side, it's going like from $12,000 to now we are like uh, somewhere at $1,000 and maybe we're going to go somewhere to $200. So it's getting cheaper and cheaper to go to space because they made a big technological jump. And what, what, what does that mean for us in, um, in construction? Well, one thing is we are at a construction uh, equipment fair today and 
when, when, the, when the cost to orbit is really expensive, you made a mass machine that costs like several billion dollars to make because it's so expensive to send it there. You have to really shave out every kilogram and make it really good. When it comes really, really cheap, you can redesign the excavator that is standing in the next hall, make it work in vacuum, and send that up to space. So we're going to build on other planets soon. Let that sink in. Good. Maybe the, the last piece be, be before we, we go over here, actually, this is my favorite picture. It's a little bit funny, and it's a little sad, because that's how most of the rebar today is installed, by back-breaking manual labor. Imagining like standing like this the, the whole day, it's, it's really tough work, but that's the current standard of how we install these rebar pieces on construction sites. Um, good. Let me show you a little bit um, how we do it. We, we have developed a platform, and he, here we're talking about vertical integration. And I'm, I'm going to walk you through it step by step. Let's start with what we're building. So we are, we are working with Reba, the steel in, in, inside um, the concrete. And most of you know here in this audience, all of our infrastructure is built in concrete. And we are focusing very much on large infrastructure projects. And one thing that um, probably you also know already about large infrastructure projects is that we need to build a lot of them, right? Um, if you stay for some more presentations today, everybody will talk to you about climate change and how construction has to do its part inside of it. But we have to build a lot of renewable energy. Just one thing, we have to build sustainable um, transportation. And most of that is going to be built in concrete. Inside, there's going to be a lot of rebar. This, for example, is a foundation for, for a wind turbine before it's casted. So a lot of steel, very complicated, um, but very important to have there so that it can stand. Um, that's, that's basically the first point. Um, on a typical large infrastructure project, we, we, we spend many millions of dollars, euros, um, on the rebar alone. So it's, it's a very big part of, of the job. But um, typically, if, if we are involved in such a project, that's the kind of information that we receive from the project partners. So most projects that we are involved in today are still is a PDF drawing that we receive as input information. So there's a structural designer. They're very, very smart. They can do all the calculations. They know all the codes. And um, sometimes we get a BIM, BIM model. Oft, most often, we get a PDF file. Um, one thing that the, the, the smart engineers often do not know is like how to produce the rebar. What kind of machines are we going to use? H how are we going to assemble it on the construction site? How are we going to prefabricate it? That's typically not something a structural engineer is thinking about. So here we have a little bit of a break already in the existing value chain that we have. And when we first started um, with automation and focus on, hey, let's say automate rebar fabrication, we quickly found out that we cannot give these PDF drawings to our robot because A, the robot doesn't understand it. And even if he would understand it, he cannot build them. So at the design phase, we have to start thinking about like, how can we design something that is like easy to manufacture and easy to manufacture for a robot? And what, what, what we built there is we built a parametric design tool. So it's, it's not built from scratch. It's based on existing software, but we built our tool, our scripts uh, on top of it. The beautiful thing about parametric design is that you can work very fast. So we invest a little bit in the start to write the scripts. But once you have them, it allows you to be very quick. Um, something that we have also seen is like, when you think a lot about it, you can actually make smarter designs. In some projects, we have saved 20% of the steel because you, you can think about it. You can look at optimizations. And is all of that steel needed? Maybe by welding the rebars instead of tying them together, we can have a structural weld and have a little bit less steel. So 
there, there's gains to make. Um, and when we talk about a project with 6,000 tons of steel, 20% is a lot of steel that, that, that you can save. Um, so it's not only good for the environment, it's also good for um, your profit. Um, maybe quickly, wh what are we seeing here on, on, on the slide? So on the left side is a, is a precast element, a concrete shape. And you can adjust the shape of the concrete element. And on the right-hand side, you see how automatically the rebar inside of the um, element gets adjusted. And not only that, we also generate the instructions of how to make it. So we know where the rebar has to go. We know where it has to be welded. We know where the wel jig needs to go. All these instructions you can automatically generate from that script. Um, by the way, you can come to our stand and play a little bit around with that script. We have it running on, on the computer there, and you can change some parameters of, of some rebar cages and see how that works. Um, once done, we upload it into some cloud software. And, and so the instructions, the design is available. And from there, we go to the next step. Now what we do is we have mobile factories. So on a large infrastructure project, it actually makes sense to bring the factory to the project. It's, it's better logistics, but also it's, it's a much better direct feedback with the customer. So if there's something wrong, we can walk two minutes, talk to our customer, and fix it. So you can iterate much faster. You, 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 can, you can fix everything in a much faster way. Um, the idea here is that Currently, it doesn't take us weeks to set up. It takes us months. But I showed you this car. We are pushing next version, next version. We want to iterate fast. So set it up. Then typically, such a big project is running for two years, for example. And then you can take down the factory and bring it to the next project. Um, these factories are, have a modular design uh, in, in the way they think. So for example, if we make a tunnel project, the next tunnel is not going to be identical. So you cannot use exactly the same factory for the next project. You have to adjust it and, and, and make it ready for the next project. And then inside the factory, it's, it's robotics. So what we do is a combination of existing machines. So we use existing rebar machines. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We use existing robotics. Uh, we use human labor, and then we combine all of these together to make the cages in the most productive way that we can come up with. And again, an iterative way, right? So currently, there's a lot of people working in our factory. In a few months, there will be less people, and then there will be less people. So it's like iterating, pushing the technology forward. The, the important thing here is that we basically, if you, if you look at our team, it's a mix of people. So we have construction engineers, we have software engineers, and you need to have the, the different pieces of knowledge. You need to have the domain knowledge, but you also need to have the technology knowledge. Otherwise, you cannot, you don't know what needs to be done, or you don't need, you don't know how it can be done. So you, you kind of like need, need this Venn diagram, the interface, you, you need the combination of these knowledges. There's cameras. So for example, one thing that is difficult about rebar, if anybody has worked with, uh, with is that it's like very imperfect. So typically, a robot is programmed in absolute coordinates. You tell the robot, weld here, and then you press play, and it welds there every time. But if you weld there every time, the rebar is not going to be there because it's like crooked and bent, and it's every time bent in a little bit of different way. So you need to put an extra layer of technology on top of it put a camera on top of it, and have it, the machine vision enabled to find where exactly do I need to weld. So that's, again, all, all of this technology is there. You just need to combine it and put it to work. Yes, and we do that. So th this is like um, three of our previous um, prototype factories that we have been running. Um, two of them in Norway and one um, in the UK. And if, if, you, if you look closely, it's, it's standard industrial arms. They have a standard welding gun on it. There's a camera on it. Again, combine it, make it work. And oftentimes, it doesn't work. Uh, so then you have to test 
again, test again until it works. That, that's, that's what we do. Now, currently we are um, setting up our fourth factory in, in, in Norway. Again, for example, in, in the last one you saw, you only saw the robot welding, right? So all the bars were placed by humans and then half of the welds were done by robots. Now we make a jump. Now we start placing some of the bars also with the robots and do more of the welds with the robots. So version by version, it's getting better. And what's maybe also uh, what we have found out in our approach is that we actually do it ourselves. So it's not like we, we, we give somebody a piece of software or a piece of hardware because it's, it's not in a shape yet where, where you can give it to anybody. So we are running it ourselves. But we also found out that to, to have the close dialogue with the customers to really use our technology ourselves, we also will be doing that in the future. So we are the ones running this equipment, running the software to provide a complete solution out of one hand, basically. So I think I, I was relatively quick. I don't know what the time is. Yep. Um, th that was all the slides that I had for you. Because we have some time left, there's um, for, for the people with two arms or one hand, we don't discriminate, but it's time uh, for, for you to have some questions maybe. Okay. E either you are shy or, or I was very uh, unclear in, 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 in describing because normally people have some questions. Well, I'm not going to hang you out. I'm going to let you off the hook. And um, we have a stand in hall C3. So um, if you rather want to put up the question like one to one, then come, come by the stand and we can discuss more there. If you want to play with a robot, you can come by. If you want to play with our software, you can come by. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>